Hey guys, how's it going? Matt Bell here at the Electric Violin Shop in beautiful Durham, North Carolina, USA. Um, we are just hanging out today, answering some questions. I was busy earlier this week and um, was actually up in Illinois for Chuck Bontrager's doctorate recital in electric violin. If you go to Chuck Bontrager's Facebook page, there's a link to be able to watch that concert. Some incredible, incredible players there. Rachel Barton Pine was there. Her daughter, uh, Sylvia Pine was there. Uh, Joe Denenzone, Greg Byers on the cello, just some ridiculously good players. Um, yeah, really awesome, really awesome time. So yeah, let's just take some questions and, uh, oh wait, I put this together, we gotta put it on here. So. Yeah, we're just going to take some general questions from people today and, and whatever you guys want to know, I will do my best to answer. Um, this question, is there only one location? Yes, we are. This physical location is in Durham, North Carolina, United States, but we ship to 90 countries around the world, uh, 91 countries actually. And we have sold instruments to people on every continent, including Antarctica. So, uh, yeah, one location to come visit. If you want to visit and come try out the violins, we're open uh, by appointment. So you can come hang out. Uh, give us a call. Give us an email. Uh, you can come visit. We're 15 minutes from the RDU airport. And we do have people fly in from all over the world, try out violins and take one home with them. Um yeah, so this is not one of those types of things. I don't like take requests and just play tunes for people. There are lots and lots of players out there who do that sort of thing, and they're really amazing. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's not my jam. So, yeah, sorry about that. But, yeah, it's not really what I do. What violin? All right, let's look at this one. What violin would you recommend to someone who's been playing traditional for a couple of years and wants to get into electric violins. I love this question. This is a great question. Let me move this down a little bit. So we got some room. So yeah, this is a great question and it really depends on what you want to do uh, with that violin. The first question I ask anybody who wants to get into electric violin is how many strings do you want? And you know, you think, violins have four strings, right? Uh, not all violins have four strings. In fact, uh, we sell more five string violins than four string violins. By the time you get into an electric violin, you're sort of already walking away from tradition a little bit. Might as well add a string. So um, I didn't have anything tuned up, but uh, this one's pretty close in tune. So let's play this. Um, yee. Let's talk about five string violins for a minute. Um, you've got your standard E, A, D, G, and C. Let me turn that violin down a little bit. Um, so you've got E, A, D, G, just like a four string violin. And then they add a C string underneath which essentially makes this a hybrid violin slash viola. Um, it's still on a, you could think about this as a 14 inch viola with a high E. Um, so yeah, that's, um, we sell more fives than fours and it's really, really common for people who go into electric violin for the first time to just go ahead and pick up a five it's a, probably a couple hours to adjust to it. I tell people 10 hours. Most people can do it faster than that if you're adjusting to, um, to five strings. So to answer the question about what would I recommend, the first thing I would ask you is to think about whether you think you could use a five string violin or not. Uh, like I said, they're super common. So the next question is, what do you, what do you really wanna do? Are you gonna be performing with this? Are you going to be recording with this? Uh, how much money are you willing to spend? If you go to our YouTube channel, we've got reviews up of just about all these different violins. 
in um, different price categories. So under a thousand dollars, between a thousand and two thousand, two thousand to three thousand. Um, and there's a bunch of different features that are available. It's like it's a lot to get into. There's like so many different electric violins. So I would say maybe go through and watch some of those review videos, kind of figure out what features you want. And if you still have questions, you can give us a call and we're happy to kind of talk you through that decision tree of deciding what instrument. But the first question I would say, yeah, let's figure out how many strings we want. And then that sort of starts us in the right direction. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Uh, let's see. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's uh, we do we do interviews and stuff from time to time. Uh, that one is not particularly on my radar. I've got about five or six people lined up right now to do interviews uh, sooner, and uh, yeah, we'll we'll try to get to as many people as we can. Um, overdrive or distortion for a Yamaha YEV one hundred four. So. Let's see if we've got a Yamaha sitting around here somewhere. We do. Let's see if it's even remotely in tune. Um, it's kind of in tune with itself, but it's, it's not in tune, but it's almost in tune with itself. First thing I would say with a YEV, they're generally too loud. Um, one of the first things you're gonna notice with a YEV is that they pretty much overdrive everything you plug them into. So I turn mine down, so sort of between half and a, and a quarter. Um, otherwise they're just too loud. And then for me, uh, I don't really like distortion pedals. I don't think distortion pedals sound good on violin. They don't sound good on guitars. No guitar player plugs his guitar into a distortion pedal and then goes to an amplifier or, or goes to the, to the board. Nobody does that. Um, most guitar players get the overwhelming majority of their distortion from their amplifier, from their tube amp. So that's how I get all my distortion sounds. Let's see if we can find one. Yeah, here's one. So this is a uh, this is a tube amp simulator. Woo! That's really loud. Here we go. So that is you. That's a lot of reverb. Um, that is using a tube amp simulator on the. Uh, I got so many things going on. The Line Six HX Stomp. That's where that's coming from. So that's where I try to get my distortion sounds is from amp simulations or from amps themselves. Trying to use a distortion pedal, they usually just sound like angry bees. That's what they sound like to me. Um, so I would highly recommend just trying to use an amp or an amp model to get the distortion. Um, all right, here's another question. Guitar is trying to help my girlfriend learn to play violin. Plenty of differences. Uh, well, yeah, there's lots of differences here. Uh, going from guitar to violin, the big, the big thing is the right hand, trying to figure out that bow. Um, 
I've been playing a violin pretty much my whole life. I can barely figure out a pick. So uh, I don't know how guitar players work those little crazy pieces of plastic. How do you play without a bow? It's crazy. Uh, all right. Next question. What is the purpose of the bandana? Oh, on the Viper. Yeah. So on the Viper, I don't have a Viper here. Yeah, I do. On the Viper, this is a Viper classic uh, that is here in the shop. And as far as I know, this thing's for sale. Um, there, we've yeah. got a we've got a few Viper classics in the shop right now. Um, so if you want a Viper, we do have a couple of Viper classics available. Um, this is the after length of the strings, and I don't know if you can hear this. I'll hold it up to the mic. You hear that? If I'm playing with heavy distortion on my Viper and I end a note and I'm trying to chug and I, and I do a real hard stop on that note, you will hear these strings. You'll get like a little shing at the end of the note. So you're like, it's horrible. I hate it. Um, so we, we wrap something around these strings to deaden out that, that sound. Um, you don't hear it when you're just playing an acoustic sort of tone uh, or a clean tone. When you really hear it is when you jack up the distortion um, and you'll hear that shing when you're done holding the note. And it's so, yeah, that's what the, the bandana does. It stops it from making that sound. All right. Next question. Let's see. Hey, we got people here from Italy, from India. Hey, thank you all for uh, coming and hanging out. How big is a seven string net compared to a five string? Okay, so not all five strings are created equal. For most four strings, there's kind of a, a small, there's a fairly small range of, of the dimensions, standard, standard dimensions for a four string violin. There is no standard for a five-string violin. They kind of they kind of all vary. Some people try to keep the necks a little smaller, and they'll have tighter string spacing. And some people keep the necks a little bigger, so that they've got wider string spacing. If you've got big hands like I do, I want a bigger neck so I've got more room to work. Or people with smaller hands want a smaller neck, and they don't mind the strings being a little tighter. That being said. I've got a seven string here. Let's just grab a random five string. Um, I had this NS design. So here is a five string neck and a seven string neck. You see they're quite a bit bigger. Maybe put them like this. Yeah, you can see a seven string is much, much bigger. Um, also, there's a little bit more depth here. Um, yeah, they're, they're pretty big. But, you know, they fit nicely in the hand. You play them. So, yes, a seven-string neck is a lot bigger. I want to order a seven-string Viper. So, we don't have WhatsApp. We're here in the U.S. The U.S. doesn't use a lot of WhatsApp. Um, and we're on landlines. So... You can send us an email, info at electricviolinshop.com. Um, and so the deal about Vipers, Vipers are very, there's two kinds of Vipers. There's a Viper Classic, which I just showed you. Um, those are available in four and five string. They're available in white, black, and red, and they are available no frets and with a true tone pickup, which is their house pickup. If you want frets, if you want something other than red, white, or black, if you want a Barbera pickup, uh, then you're going to need to order a custom Viper. And custom Vipers have a bit of a wait right now. Uh, their shop is backed up for a number of reasons. Uh, but it's a fairly significant wait from the time you order and put down a 50% deposit to the time you're going to get your custom Viper made. Um, they're, they're making some changes. They're coming out a little faster than they were um, a year ago, but it's, it's a bit of a, it's going to be a bit of a wait. So if you want to give us an email info at electric violin shop.com 
we can help you get that ordered. Um, yeah, same kind of deal. Blue one made by Mark Wood. Um, it's going to be a little while. Uh, I wish we could. I wish we could donate some electric file ins. That's not really how the business works here. We actually, we're a retail establishment, so we buy these instruments and then we sell them uh, with a small markup on that. Um, so yeah, margins are not what I wish they were. I wish I wish we could afford to send some instruments around the world. I would love to do it for free, but we cannot do that, unfortunately. Brandon, what's up, man? Good to see you, brother. He's a fantastic violinist in Las Vegas. If you guys want to follow Brandon Summers. Um, I'm in Mexico. Can I buy? Si se puede. Se puede comprar en México. Uh, hablamos español aquí. We speak Spanish here. Um, y podemos enviar a México. We can sell, we can send, we can ship to uh, many countries around the world. Enviamos a como 90 países en el mundo. Entonces se puede comprar su, su instrumento en nuestro sitio. You can buy the, the instrument on our website. Y podemos enviar, no hay problema. We can ship it. It's not a problem. So... Uh, preamp suggestions. Yes. Um, yeah, the pickups can be a little harsh, uh, and it's not, no, it's not just you. And YEVs are, uh, a little crispy to begin with. They are kind of bright. So, um, I like the YEV. I just played one. We have a video on our YouTube channel that demonstrates a bunch of preamps. If you go to the electric violin shop page, click the little, um, the little search button and just type in preamp. And we've got a number of videos that will pop up and I'll demonstrate some different preamps. The first thing I would suggest is to turn your YEV down. Um, the, like I said, they're, they're too loud. They, they overdrive a lot of things that they plug into. And that little bit of overdrive is actually going to create some harsh overtones. So I would recommend turning the instrument down to half or even a quarter volume. That's going to help a lot. And then um, I like um, I like the stuff from LR Bags. I like the, the Venue preamp. I like the Paracoustic DI. Both of those are super popular, super um, helpful. Um, yeah, I like both of those. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, all right, here's some seen a few times. What's up, Jeremy? Uh, I've seen a few times that you've mentioned that you use some distortion in your clean tone. I do. Yes. Um, yeah. So it depends on which distortion you're using. Uh, let me see if we can dial one in super fast here. I don't have a, um, I don't have anything really set up. Um, let's see what we can do. Unfortunately, I don't have anything set up right now. I'm using my, my HX stomp to demo here. And I don't have any presets built where I could sort of, I was trying to figure out if I could dial in just a tiny bit of distortion. Um, yeah, I would find something like maybe a Soul Food pedal. The Soul Food by EHX or Electro Harmonics. That is a super, super flexible pedal. And you can dial in just a, the tiniest bit of distortion and it's going to warm your violin up quite a bit. Uh, the soul food pedal. I like a lot. Um, would definitely try that one. Um, next question. Let's see. Do I know of anybody who could add half height frets to a normal electric violin? That didn't start with them. I don't. Uh, what I would do is if I wanted to add frets to a violin that didn't come with them, I would probably contact a, a mandolin guy, somebody who makes mandolins, uh, cause it's the same dimensions and, and see if they would be willing to fret your violin. That's, I would, I would holler at a mandolin person and see if they could do that. Um, <laughs> I love this question. Cheapest, but best. <laughs> um, 
So I, I think I understand what you're saying. Like, so there's, there are these curves, right? And as we, if we go up in price, we go up in quality, right? Everybody knows that. If you go up in price, you go up in quality. Is there a point at which that starts to roll off, right? And the question is, once I get to say a thousand dollars, and I buy a $1,000 carbon fiber bow and a $2,000 carbon fiber bow, is the $2,000 bow twice as good as the $1,000 bow? No, it is not. There's a thing called the diminishing returns, which means as I pay more, like the, the amount of quality goes up slower than the amount of price. Does that make sense? Um, the question is, so I have a $3,000 carbon fiber bow and a $1,500 carbon fiber bow. The $3,000 bow is probably 25% better than the $1,500 bow. It's not twice as good. It's probably 25% better. Um, and the question is, how bad do you need that 25%? I need it like I need it. That's why I bought the bow. So if we want to say like the best value in carbon fiber bow, I would probably say like the Coda bow, uh, like the NX, the diamond NX, which I think is around $400. I think that's kind of the sweet spot four or 500 bucks in a carbon fiber bow. So if you, um, if you spend twice as much as 500, you don't get twice as much bow. Um, but if you go less than that, like if you go from 250 to 500, yeah, I think, I think a $500 carbon fiber bow is twice as good as a $250 bow. So, um, I think may, yeah, maybe the sweet spot is around $500, um, five or $600 for a carbon fiber bow. And as you start going up from there, that's when price is going up faster than quality. It, it's just the question is how bad do you need that quality? Um, you know, I could have bought a $500 carbon fiber bow. My $3,000 carbon fiber bow is quite a bit better. It's not six times better, but it's quite a bit better. So I just, I needed it. I need that quality for what I'm doing. And so that's why I bought it. Um, I hope that makes sense. Does that answer your question? C... Sí, si sí está en México, podemos enviar a México. Um, pienso que ya contesté. Um, oh, you can really hear the strings on a fiddle. Well, so my setup here, you can see we have a we have a little mic here. This is a Samson uh, G Track Pro, and it is sitting right off camera, so it can pick up my voice. It also has a direct input in the back. So when I play for you, you're hearing uh, about 50% direct input from the instrument and about 50% what's happening in the room. So I'm plugging the instrument into my HX stomp and I split the signal. It comes to the, the G-Track Pro. So it's um, you've got a direct line to you here. Um, and then also, it goes to a Fishman Loudbox performer that's in the room, and you can hear both of those. You can hear the direct signal and what's coming out of the amp. You're also, because I'm standing right next to the mic, you can hear the strings on the violin. In fact, like this one's not plugged in at all. You can hear it, right? So if I play it with a bow... So you can hear just the sound coming off the strings. In a live music situation, you wouldn't be able to hear that. You would only be able to hear what's coming out of the amp. Because if I got a drummer banging around up there, you're never going to hear that tiny amount of sound coming off the strings. Yes, Sasha, that's a great point. Um, the big thing about guitar distortions, when they're using an amp, it's a lot of it is that a guitar speaker, the speaker on that amp um, has a very, very distinctive EQ. And that's why they all use different speakers because they all sound very, very different. Um, so yeah, that 
if you have digitally, if you have the ability to do a distortion pedal and then a speaker simulator, that makes a really big difference. I would probably never just go to a distortion pedal and then out to the PA. If I were just going to use a distortion pedal, I would do a distortion pedal and a speaker cab simulator and then go out to the PA. Um, Chuck Bontrager. What's up, Chuck Bontrager? I was just at Chuck's doctorate recital in Illinois. Chuck is going to be the first person in the world to have a doctorate degree in electric violin. So very exciting. Interested in my thoughts on overarching the industry. What can we do to make sure we're not a fad like saxes in the 80s? Uh, boy, if I had the answer to that, I don't know. Uh, hopefully the fact that uh, there are so many different things sounds that an electric violin can make. A saxophone kind of makes like one sound. It sounds like a saxophone. Um, and due to the work, a lot of the work that Chuck is doing, uh, where he can make his violin sound like dang near anything. Um, I think the flexibility of the electric violin is going to be the thing that leads to longevity for this instrument and widespread use for this instrument more than like the saxophone trying to straighten up this little guy here. Sorry. Eh. Um, I think the saxophone probably fell a little bit out of favor because people kind of got tired of that one sound that they heard saxophones making. Um, whereas electric violins can make just about any sound that you're creative enough to come up with. Um, and they're cooler. Pickups. Which ones do I recommend? Customers ask if I can have you guys install their pickups. Yes. So, um, and it depends on if we're talking about a pickup going on an acoustic violin to make it an, like an acoustic electric, or if you're talking about a pickup to go on a solid body instrument. Um, man, I, for my money, if, if you're looking at the whole overall picture, sound, flexibility, number of strings, availability, uh, how maintenance free they are. Uh, I would say probably the starfish I would say is, is kind of all around maybe your best choice for pickups. Uh, I am primarily a Barbera guy. I, I only play Barberas and that's cause they got a little more meat in the bottom end. And that's what Chuck and I are both rock guys. We like lots of heavy distortion. I want tons of bottom end. I want the room to get blurry when I play my low strings. Um, so I need all the bottom end power that a Barbera has, but there's a couple of drawbacks to using a Barbera. One, um, they're really expensive. Two, they do occasionally need a little bit of maintenance. And three, they're really hard to get. Um, Rich Barbera does not sell those pickups to individuals. He only sells to manufacturers. So if you've got an instrument and something happens to your pickup, maybe somebody drops something on it and it breaks. For you to get a new pickup, it's, it's kind of not easy to do. Um, with a starfish pickup, it's a little more balanced top to bottom. So I think the bottom end on, on a starfish is not significantly more pronounced than the bottom, than the top end. So you have about the same volume from your E string all the way down. Whereas a Barbera, it gets meatier as you go down. Uh, so the starfish may be more balanced, certainly less maintenance intensive. They are a little bit cheaper and they're way easier to get. So yeah, I, I think if you're making for solid body instruments, I'd say the Starfish is an outstanding choice. Um, and they come in four, five, six, and seven string models. So hope that was helpful. Yeah, you can play your whole life and still learn. I hope so. I hope you're still learning. Um, I intend to be, I hope to be uh, <laughs> learning until about two days after I die. Um, Let's see, difference between fretless and a fretted Viper. I don't have a fretted Viper here to show you right now. All of mine are at the house. Um, but uh, yeah, fretted is, here's a fretted Cantini. Um, so the frets in Espanol se llama trastes, um, but it's, it's just like a little bar that sticks, it's embedded in the fingerboard and it sticks up a little bit and it allows you to feel 
on the fingerboard where the right place to put your fingers are. Um, with a guitar or a bass, you actually play behind the fret and they stick up a little higher. So you play behind the fret and it actually tunes the instrument out. If you're playing a, a fretted violin the right way, you actually play on top of the fret and you can feel it under your fingers, but it, it doesn't cause the instrument to tune out. So you can still play them out of tune, but it sort of gives you some landmarks on this. And a lot of people are like, well, the entire point of the violin is that it's a fretless instrument. And, you know, we practice our intonation, so we don't need frets and yada, yada, yada. Yes, that is true in an environment where you can hear yourself play. Uh, I was just at Chuck's concert the other night. Uh, his violin amp all by itself without going through the mains or anything was well over a hundred decibels. Um, and once the, the, the drummer starts hitting and guitars and basses are going, and maybe we had up to seven violinists on the stage at a time, you can't necessarily always hear yourself very well. And if you're playing and singing at the same time, which I do and Joe Denizone does and a lot of other players do, these become kind of helpful because these are not things that, that, you know, people back in the 1700s ever even imagined. They didn't imagine amplification to those volume levels. They didn't imagine trying to sing and play rock music at the same time. This stuff hadn't been invented. So, uh, yeah, frets can be really helpful in sort of some of the extreme situations that we encounter on rock stages that classical players just, they never encounter those situations. A classical player can't even imagine a situation where they're playing and they can't hear their violin. I mean, what do you mean I can't hear it? It's right under my ear. It's really loud. It's loud compared to, I guess, somebody talking, but it's not loud compared to drummers crashing into cymbals. Um, you know, the, in the in the 1700s, they just didn't have, no, nothing was that loud back then. We're very noisy people in the 21st century. Um, how do you tune an NS design violin? Yeah, good question. Um, so there are, you notice there are no tuners up here on the headstock. Um, you know, strings come with a ball end and we actually, the ball end is here. So we feed the string kind of backwards through the instrument. These are 40 to one geared tuners down here. Um, so it's basically like having fine tuners. So yeah, that's how you tune an S design violin. Very ingenious. So yeah, I make my fives the same distance and curve of a four. Yeah, but beyond five, if you're going trying to go a six or a seven, yeah, you got to kind of change angles and distances and all that, or you just run out of space. Uh, Marat, what's happening, Marat? Marat is the creator of, if we have one hanging on the wall. Oh my God, I think we sold them all. Um, the Volta violin. He is uh, the creator of the, the violin that has the built-in speakers, which is really balling. So very cool. What's up, Debbie? Um, yeah, Brandon loves the YV because it's lightweight. Yeah, they are super lightweight. And if you're out there busking for eight hours at a time, like Brandon sometimes does, uh, it's nice to have a violin that doesn't weigh too much. Um, in order a Broughton High Pass filter for my YEV. Um, the stock input impedance, one mega ohm. Good question. Is that okay for the YEV? No, one mega ohm is just fine for the YEV. Um, if you, if you got something that had a, a 10 mega ohm input, it would probably be even better, but, um, the difference is so minuscule at, at that point, uh, probably would not make a huge difference. So you'd have a really hard time hearing the difference. One mega ohm is going to be sufficient for a YEV. Yep, good question. Cantini, Europhonic, five or six strings. They don't make a six string, unfortunately. They only make a five. Uh, are they still being made? Can I answer in French? Uh, no, I cannot. Only English and Spanish. Um, sorry. Cantini, I do have a five. 
we have a five string fretted in stock right here. You can see this is the Cantini. Um, so yes, we do have Cantini five string fretted instruments in stock. Um, but no, I, I wish I could answer in French, but I can't, sorry. All right. Okay, here's Pete Carocho who makes, uh, let's see if I got one of his violins here, I do. Pete makes these really fantastic EVL violins. Here's a five that he makes, and he's, I think we've got a six around here somewhere as well. Um, so yeah, Pete is gonna say 10 to 12 millimeters wider at the nut. Um, are you saying, uh, this was a question from earlier, you're saying the difference between a five and a seven would be 10 to 12 millimeters wider? I think that's what you're saying. So uh, there's an answer. Would I recommend a, a Yamaha SV200 or a YSV250? There is no YSV250. There is a Y, there is an SV250. Um, I would not recommend, there is a YSV104 and that is a practice instrument only. The YSV, 104 is only for practice. It only has a headphone output. It doesn't have an output that would go to an amp. Um, so the difference between a, an SV and the SV200 and the SV250, good question. I don't think I have either one of those hanging up right now. Uh, the SV200 has all of the electronics built right into the instrument itself. So the there's a headphone jack and a quarter inch jack right there on the body of the SV200. The SV250, they made it a lot lighter. It has a little uh, jack that goes out to a control box that you'd have to wear on your belt. And that has all the preamp and electronics and all that stuff in it. So that the instrument on your shoulder is lighter but then you've got to deal with this belt pack thing and then that goes out to the amp or the wireless or whatever. Um, so the question for me, if you're trying to decide between an SV200 and an SV250 is what's more important to you? Is the weight of the instrument super important to you? Maybe you're doing acrobatics or whatever, you need something lighter, uh, then probably the SV250 is better. The SV250 is gonna sound better it's got two pickups on it. There's a bridge pickup and a body pickup and you can blend between those two. So the 250 is gonna sound better. The 200 is gonna be a little more convenient if you don't wanna have to deal with belt packs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you wanna have a instrument where you can plug your headphones directly into the instrument and practice with headphones, uh, the SV200, there's gonna be just less connections and all that kind of stuff with that. So it kind of depends on what you wanna do with it. Um, next question. In one of your videos, you mentioned you don't use much rosin. That's true. Um, I'd like to avoid rosin, but my bow slips all over the place. You need better rosin. Uh, the problem is a lot of people buy these little $5 cakes of rosin and then wonder why they're not good. Um, cause they were five bucks. Uh, I like magic rosin. We sell magic rosin and it's not terribly expensive. I think, you know, 12 bucks maybe or something. Uh, I like magic rosin a lot. I am actually a leatherwood rosin artist. Um, I use leatherwood uh, rosin. It's made in Australia. It's, it's bespoke. It's a, uh, it's a uh, custom made rosin. So that's what I use. And, and probably three or four swipes about every two hours is, is plenty for me. Um, a lot of people say, well, I use bass rosin or cello rosin. I mean, you can do that. To me, it's just like, it's really sticky and it gets all over your strings and it kind of kills your tone. And I don't really dig that. So um, yeah, I like magic rosin and leatherwood rosin, both of those. A lot of people would recommend to start playing on an acoustic instead of an electric. Um, yeah, so that is true. I think it depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a symphony player or you want to be a classical soloist, then I think you should learn on an acoustic instrument. Uh, you should learn on the instrument that you're going to perform on. 
If you think you're mostly going to perform on an electric, learn on an electric. It's the same deal with guitars. Uh, you know, they talk to kids about learning the guitar. If you don't have any interest in playing acoustic guitar, you want to play electric guitar, you want to go be in a rock band, why, why bother with an acoustic? It just I would just go get an electric. So, yeah, it depends on what you want to do. And you can go back and forth. Um, the technique is a little different from acoustic to electric. Um, you're going to have some adjustment when you go. If you learn on an electric, you're going to have some adjustment when you go to an acoustic. But if you learn on an acoustic, you're going to have some adjustment when you go to an electric. And I think I don't think it's any harder to adjust one way or the other. Um, yeah, I, I would... I can't, it depends on what you're going to do. I very, very seldom even pick up an acoustic violin. I never gig on one. I only gig on electric violin. That's my jam. That's what I do. Uh, it, when people hire me, they know what they're getting. Uh, I'm not going to come walking in with a traditional acoustic violin. It's just, you're not going to see it. So um, me learning to play on an acoustic, I mean, it was good for me, I guess, but I very seldom even use that skill set. So um, I would say it's kind of like what you're going to do with it. If you're going to be an electric player, you're going to go play in a band, learn on an electric. Yeah, good question. I've never invested in a bow more than $100. What would you say the difference between high-end bows and cheap ones? Um, yeah, I'm a car guy. I grew up near Detroit. So if you've ever driven like a ragged out old beater car, and then you get in like a Ferrari. You're like, oh, well, the pedals are in all the same places and the steering wheel is in the same place. But this experience is nothing like driving my ragged old old beater. Um, playing a $50 bow versus playing a $3,000 bow is a radically, radically different experience. Uh, the $3,000 bow will do everything you ask it to do for better or for worse. So I, I would say you might actually be kind of bummed out if you pick up a $3,000 bow at first and be like, oh, I feel like this thing's all over the place because playing $50 bows, you've kind of learned that you just have to kind of just manhandle that thing in order to get it to do what you want. And you may not have developed the kind of nuanced, um, yeah, sort of find the, the, the super corners and edges of what your right hand is doing. Um, you're a good player though. So I think if you picked up a really expensive bow, it would not take you very long before you went, Oh, this thing will do everything I want it to do. And I, I, to, to go from, you know, detache to, to Arco or your standard plan. I don't know all the names. Um, it, you know, to go from one style of bowing to another, I don't have to fight this bow. It's almost like the bow is trying to help me. Um, that's the biggest difference. Um, yeah, it's kind of like the difference between driving an old beater and driving a sports car. Um, planning to go for your master's in electric violin. Good thinking. I'm just finishing mine up right now. Um, majoring in music ed. As far as I know, there is exactly one place on the planet where you can get a master's or a doctorate degree in electric violin, and that is at the University of Illinois in Champaign. Um, now, there are schools that will let you play your electric. Berkeley, uh, you can play an electric violin at Berkeley. You won't get your degree in electric violin. They don't call it that. Um, but you can get a violin degree and Dr. David Wallace, who's the head of the string department at Berkeley is a, is a close friend. And he actually wrote one of the pieces that Chuck and I played in Chuck's recital on Monday. Uh, and it was written for six string electric violin and seven string with looper. So there's the, the people that are in charge at these places are composing music for these instruments. Uh, but your diploma is not going to say electric violin. I think if you go to Belmont, you can learn from Tracy Silverman who is a six string uh, electric violinist. Uh, Scott Tizier is at University of North Texas and he is an outstanding electric violinist. Um, there are some places, I think Frost School of Music at Miami, they're pretty open-minded down there. There are some places where you can go and play your electric violin, but if you wanna get your degree in electric violin, uh, University of Illinois under Professor Rudolf Hawken 
is uh, kind of where you want to go. Um, Pete, yeah, Pete who makes these EVL violins. That is true. Not all pickups are intended to be used on all designs. Uh, my experience with the Starfish pickup is it's pretty versatile. Uh, we've, get, we've got starfishes in here on a wide variety of instruments. Pete uses a lot of Barbera pickups, which is my personal favorite. Um, yeah, they just, Barbera and, and starfish both sound great and they're extremely versatile. I don't think I've heard either one of those on a solid body instrument sound bad. Um, I heard a Barbera on an acoustic violin that was like, oh, my favorite pickup on the instrument that people tend to want to hear. This is going to be like the best of both worlds. And it turned out to be like the worst of both worlds. It was, I was really bummed out. Uh, a Barbera on an acoustic. The problem with sitting on the top of an acoustic violin, that Barbera requires a really stable surface to sit on because it's so thick and it takes a lot of vibration. Sitting on the top of an acoustic violin that's so thin and it's moving, uh, it just didn't work. It didn't work out. Uh, Marat, yeah, so I think we need to convert acoustic folks into an electric violin world. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, there are way more acoustic players out there than there are electric players. So we're going to be sniping the, uh, the acoustic players. Um, I think the younger you learn to get on an electric, the easier it's going to be for your body to make those uh, transitions too. Um, but it's never too late. There's people that pick these things up in their sixties and seventies and, and, you know, they figure it out. Uh, oh, and yeah, good point that these instruments, like a, a very expensive electric violin will be six or $7,000. Like that would be a very expensive electric violin. And in the acoustic world are like six or seven, like my bow cost more than $7,000. So yeah, people that are used to playing acoustic violins at a high level they're they're you know in a in a major orchestra or they're a soloist you know they're playing instruments that are six and seven figures you know hundreds of thousands of dollars millions of dollars they're like seven grand for an instrument <laughs> my shoulder rest costs that much so yeah these are very very inexpensive compared to high-end acoustic violins um how much of a difference is a realist violin regular to the pro? That's a great question, Darren. Um, I hope you're doing good, man. I enjoy following your stuff on the, on the socials. Uh, a, a really big difference. I don't think I have two of them ready to go in order to show you. I was just looking over there. Um, yeah, it's a pretty significant difference. If you go to our YouTube channel and we did a review on um, acoustic electric violins, there might've been two videos. Maybe it was like uh, uh, affordable, like budget acoustic electrics and high-end acoustic electrics. Um, but we did review both of those realist instruments. And yeah, it's a pretty significant difference between the two. Um, to me, I think they're priced appropriately. I think the, the lower priced one competes very well at that price point, And the higher priced one also competes very well at that price point. So uh, yeah was using an effects pedal with my uh, mini crybaby pitchfork live with a rock band. Is a guitar amp needed? Yes. Excellent question. So, and don't know. Yes was not my answer. Sorry. Uh, I'm the, yes to answering your question. I will answer your question. Is a guitar amp needed? Um, I have played in situations that are so loud that they make your brain bleed. And I don't use an amp. Uh, I played at Chuck's concert Monday. Didn't use an amp. I just, I run direct into the PA and then ask him to fold it back in the monitor. Uh, I do all of my tone processing in my Helix or my HX Stomp. Um, so no, I don't even, I, I guess I do own an amp or two sitting around somewhere. I never take them anywhere. Um, I just go direct to the PA. If you are playing in a situation where you always have access to a really good PA, then you probably don't need an amp. Uh, Chuck, who's getting his doctorate in electric violin, has an entire room full of amps at his house. And I think he had three or four half stacks at his concert the other night. Uh, and it's, he just always sounds amazing. Chuck is not always in a situation where the venue is going to have a PA that's powerful enough 
for his violin to sound the way it needs to sound. So he's bringing in those half stacks. I pretty much always play in places where they've got really like super, super sufficient PA. Um, that's just how my career is working out. And so I don't, I don't ever bring an amp anywhere. So you don't need one. Um, and then the question is the amp, I don't get any tone benefit. I wouldn't get any tone benefit from bringing an amp because I do all of my tone production in my effects pedals. Chuck actually gets a lot of his tone from the amp itself. So the question would be whether you're getting the tone you want out of your pedal board. And if you are, then you just need to be louder and you just need a PA system. If you want an amp to do a lot of your tone production for you, I wouldn't even begin to suggest an amp for that. It's kind of like trying to suggest a pair of shoes for you to wear. You're going to have to find a pair of shoes that feel good on your feet. Um, I would say if you're on a pretty tight budget, uh, I would look at the Katana amps from Boss. Uh, they, they sound good with electric violins. They're only a few hundred bucks. Uh, the Katana 100 gets relatively loud. It, it couldn't compete on Chuck's stage. Um, but it, it does pretty well in most situations. Um, and you can get, you can get a lot of tone out of that. Uh, the Katana 100 may not be a bad place to look if you're, if you're wanting to start at a few hundred bucks. Uh, I think most of Chuck's amps are starting, uh, closer to a thousand or up from there. Um, and then they're big, they're big half stacks and you need roadies to move them in and out. So, um, yeah, like every, every situation is different. Um, yeah. What's up, Dennis? Are all five string violins tuned the same? No, no, you don't have to do anything. Um, in Western classical based music, which I would even include rock and roll and jazz in that. Um, yeah, we typically tend to tune our violins from top to bottom E, A, D, G, C. Uh, but you know, here in the U S and Europe, we forget that India is like three times the population of the U S and in Indian Carnatic music, they're tuned in fourths yeah. and not in fifths, um, fourths and fifths. They kind of, there's like D, G, D, G, D, G. Um, so, uh, no, not all five string violins are tuned the same. And I think if you include India in the equation, uh, on a global scale, maybe half of elect, maybe half of five string violins are tuned E, A, G, D, C. Um, no, but you can, you can. Tune that thing however you want to. Uh, yeah, are the YEV light kits still available? Yes. In fact, I just sold one today. Um, there is a, an aftermarket kit that you can put on a YEV uh, made by Spectra. And let's go flipping through some of these. So this is a, a LED light kit that you can add to your YEV violin. Uh, they're like... 400 and 459 or 499 something like that and these suckers are bright i got studio lighting in here right now um it's it's really bright where i'm standing right now so this is kind of like being on a stage and you can very much see the light on this instrument right now so um yes these are available it is called a spectra s-p-e-c-t-r-a lighting kit um and i think they're around 450 or 500 bucks add that onto the instrument we will install it for you for a for a small fee if you want uh, or you can install it yourself it's not terribly difficult to do um, but yes these are available they're on our website and uh, i dig these a lot yeah hey this is a lot of fun thank you guys for hanging out and doing all this um do i know which amp cables to pick for your violin uh, no, I just use a regular instrument cable. I'm, I'm usually running wireless. Um, but yeah, just any quarter inch cables, probably good enough. Um, practicing with a passive or active cello using headphones to not disturb others and that's design. Uh, yeah, good choice. Do I need an amp or can I plug headphones straight into the cello? You cannot plug headphones straight into a wave or an NXT cello. The output is, it's the total wrong type of output and it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand times too weak 
to power your headphones. So you would need a um, you would need a headphone amp of some type. So if you have an amp with a headphone jack on it, that's going to work. You can buy like a little uh, tiny headphone amp. Um, uh, there's little things like this. This is not my favorite product, but it's a decent product. Um, you can plug your instrument into here. And this actually has um, a thing where you could have several people practicing at once and link the whole thing together. It's a decent headphone amp. Um, it's a better headphone amp than this app. That's too weird. Yeah, it's it's um yeah, it's a decent headphone amp. It's okay. Um, if you've got an if you've got a multi effects pedal, um, your multi effects pedal probably has a headphone out. Um, the thing about practicing with headphones, there are some super cheap headphone amps. You can get them for you know twenty or thirty bucks that don't have any reverb in them. I don't like those because just the dry amplified sound of an electric instrument is kind of, eh. um, it's, it's the reason that Marat invented the Volta violin. He was, he was playing his violin outside at a wedding. He's like, you know, the honest truth is violins sound like crap outside when they sound really good as if you're in a concert hall or in your bathroom or in a, a stairwell where there's some reverb, you know, people say, Oh, the acoustics in this room are wonderful. What you mean is this room has a lot of reverb. That's what you mean. Um, so, that's when string instruments sound the best is when they've got some reverb on them. So I would try to find a, a way to power my headphones that has some reverb in it. Um, so, um, yeah, if your, your multi effects pedal will have that, uh, or just, yeah, I would try to find something that has some reverb in it. There is a little product from Vox. I think the, the guitar amp manufacturer Vox V O X that it's basically it plugs directly into the output of your instrument. And then it's got a little headphone out um, and they've got an acoustic version, a bass version. They've got a, a regular electric guitar version. I kind of like the bass version, honestly. Um, and it's cause you probably are not going to be running a ton of distortion on your cello. Uh, yeah. Just find something that you can plug in your instrument into that has some reverb in and then go to your headphones from that. That's what I would do. Um, how often do I rehair? No, it just kind of grows on me. Um, now, uh, how often do I rehair my bow when it needs it? Um, and it's usually, uh, depends on how much I'm playing, how much chopping I'm doing, how much slamming the bow off the string I'm doing. If I got hair flying everywhere all the time, uh, when I get to about three quarters of a shank, um, so, you know, you've got this much width of hair on there. When about a quarter of that hair is missing, then I'll get my bow re -haired. Um, So, yeah, it depends. It depends really. And sometimes the, uh, sometimes you get hair that just, you basically can't break it. And sometimes you get hair that the first time you play, there's stuff flying all over the place. And I mean, it comes off of horses. There's, there's a fair amount of variability in that hair. So sometimes it's, it's durable hair and sometimes it's not. Um, yeah, people talking about rosin here. I played a wedding gig with a Viper all the time, dude. I play tons of wedding gigs on Vipers. Yeah. Um, I've got a silver sparkle one that looks really nice. And then I've got a sort of a blonde wood one. Uh, yeah, I play tons. I play tons of wedding gigs on Vipers. Yeah, absolutely. Decent, affordable amp can be used for multiple instruments. Wow. Everybody wants good and cheap at the same time. Um, those two don't generally go together. Uh, although, uh, multiple, in man, it, it depends on what those multiple instruments are. I do like the Boss Katana series uh, because they're super versatile and they have a bunch of effects built into them. Uh, the Fishman Loudbox ones are warmer and to me, they sound a little better and thicker, but they don't have like distortion and stuff built in. So it just, it depends on what you want. Uh, I say the Katana is pretty good. The Boss Katana amps, the Fishman Loudbox amps are good amps. Um, yeah, I, I think both of those are good. Yeah. Uh, and I don't play anything that's made out of wood. And my deal is because I'm I'm pretty likely to just throw that bow. Um, so I only I only play carbon fiber bows just because I'm yeah it's, it's I throw it 
probably a dozen times a night and, and I probably catch it 11 out of those 12 times. So if it was wood, I'd be really bummed out. Um, what bow am I referring to? I guess this is an old question. When I'm talking about the, the nice carbon fiber bow, I have an Arcus that I like a lot. Um, and if, oh, and if, if you're talking about the one that, that I thought was kind of the sweet spot, about 500 bucks, the, uh, the Kodabo Diamond NX, I think is Diamond, the NX or the SX or either one of those are probably right in that sweet spot for, for value and, and uh, you know, price versus quality. Um, recommendations for a first step in a high end bows depends on what you mean by high end. Um, under, under a thousand bucks, uh, Coda bow makes some really nice bows over 1500 bucks. Uh, I really like Arcus. Is there a good source for getting music that's composed for five plus strings? Yes, there is. I actually write some music. You can go to my website, mattbellviolinist.com. I've got a couple of tunes there that are written for five string. Um, David Wallace, if you go to docwallacemusic.com, I think, has a bunch of stuff for extended range violins. Joe Denon Zone, if you go to, to I think it's joedviolin.com. Um, has a lot of music written for extended range violins. Um, Martha Mook, M-O-O-K-E. She writes for electric five string electric viola. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people out there writing music for five or more strings. Yeah. Wow. We're going to make some people mad here. Why don't you think electric violins have caught on the same way electric guitars and pianos have? Because they're hard to play. Electric violins are a lot harder to play. Violin is harder to play. That's, that's why more people play guitar than piano or more people play guitar than violin. I mean, when you pick up your violin, when you pick up a violin for the first time, it's what? It's a year before you're playing anything that doesn't sound like somebody strangling a cat. Uh, guitar. I taught my son to play a song the day that he picked up a guitar. He picked up a guitar and by the end of that day, he was playing songs on the guitar. So guitars are easy to play compared to violins. Um, it, it, and I would say like to be a bad guitar player is way easier than being a bad violinist. Um, if we're talking about world-class guitar players, I mean, it takes a lifetime to learn to play the guitar at that level. It takes a lifetime to learn to play the violin at that level. I don't want to minimize what like the, these amazing pianists and guitarists are doing, but to, to get to the level where you can play a song that your friends will recognize on the guitar or the piano, you can do it in a day. Uh, violin, it could be years. So that's why they haven't caught on the way guitars and pianos have. They're hard to play. They're cooler, but yeah. Um, it's probably cheating, but I bring two violins. That's not cheating. That's using your head. Um, no. Yeah, absolutely. So there, the, it's a big thing in rock bands where guitar players, maybe they'll tune their low string to an E. Sometimes they tune to an E flat. Um, and that's done. They'll tune down a half a step to make the guitar sound chunkier. They'll do it to help a vocalist who's got to sing 150 nights a year or 200 nights a year to just bring everything down a half a step. And oh my God, this is so much easier. Um, so yeah, lots of guitar players will tune down a half a step. And I can play in E flat. I can play in G flat, but I rather not. You know, why do I want to work that hard? Um, and I don't care how good you are. You're going to be a better soloist in G than you are in G flat. I, I don't know anybody who is as proficient at soloing in G flat as they are in G. And, and this includes like world-class players that I know, guys that are ridiculously good. Joe Denonzone, probably one of the best uh, improvising violinists alive. I guarantee that Joe would rather play in G than G flat. So is it cheating to bring a violin as tuned down half step? No, it's not cheating at all. <laughs> I, I don't even know if cheating is a thing. Um, yeah, Pete sold a, a, yeah. So Indian violinists or Carnatic violinists generally tune in like fifth pairs, uh, or fourth pairs, depending on how you look at it. So, yep. 
Um, do I play Baroque music? Mm, I do one Baroque tune if Bach counts, but I rewrote it. So um, I do. You know who does a lot more of that is my professor, Rudolf Hawken at the University of Illinois. He plays a lot of like arpeggioni music, which is an old, old instrument. He's got a six string electric viola uh, that he plays a lot of old Baroque music on. There are some other players at University of Illinois that are playing pretty much exclusively Baroque music on electric instruments. So, yeah. Okay. What type of violin would I recommend to beginners? I would recommend getting a teacher and then letting your teacher help you pick a violin. Uh, please don't teach yourself the violin. Uh, like I said, you can learn to play guitar or piano. You can learn to play a song in about a day, and it takes about a year on the violin. In that year, you can develop some really bad habits that you could literally hurt yourself. Uh, you know, there are so many players out there with repetitive strain injuries. There are a lot of things that you can teach yourself how to do the violin. I would say in general is not one of them. There are a number of self-taught players out there and they're good, right? Um, but on average, I think if you try to teach yourself to play the violin, you're probably making a mistake. Um, so my advice would be to find a teacher and then let your teacher help you pick an instrument. Because uh, teachers tend to be very opinionated. And if you show up with something they don't like, they will let you know about that. Um, wow, we still got lots of, uh, lots of comments here. Thank you guys for hanging out. Um, I'm kind of, my voice is going to run out soon. So I'll take a couple more of these and then we'll call it a day. Um, is a processor or an audio interface better for live performance? Um, I like using a processor. Um, although my DJ uses an audio interface when he plays his bass line. My DJ is also a bass player. He runs his bass into an interface into Ableton and then out to the world. Um, I think, I think a, you can definitely make a case for both of those. Um, the thing is, if you're doing with an audio interface, you're bringing your MacBook on a stage every night. MacBooks are not really designed to be on stages. Uh, your gear, you know, your your processor, your Stomp or your Helix or your ME80. Those things are designed to be on stages. And if a drunk girl falls on one or somebody pours a beer on it, uh, it's going to survive better than your MacBook is. So it kind of depends on what kind of gigs you're playing. I was playing in a party band for a lot of years uh, where there's like drunk people flying around and, you know, people jumping on stage and waving stuff around. And uh, there's not a chance that I would bring a MacBook into that situation. But my producer does. He takes his MacBook into those situations and, I have no idea how it hasn't gotten broken yet, but, um, all right. I think that's all I'm going to do for today. Thank all you guys for hanging out. This has been a lot of fun. Hopefully you got your question answered and, um, yeah, good times. So I will see you guys back here next week. Hopefully we'll have a, uh, another topic to talk about, but, uh, I was digging the AMA. Thank you guys for asking so many great questions and we will see you, um, next time. All right.